Awesome. Well, welcome to my lightning talk, uh, where we'll discuss procedural modeling with micro web assemblies. Uh, I'm Sean Isom. I am based in New York uh, for my day job. I'm a senior engineering manager at Adobe working on optimizing our cloud platform. Uh, but I love burning the midnight oil working on WebAssembly. Uh, I know quite a few folks here uh, from some of the work we have done at Adobe with WebAssembly on the server side. Uh, but today I'm here to talk about a completely different topic, uh, running tons of small WebAssembly blocks in parallel uh, and some applications of that technology in procedural graphics. Uh, this is kind of a crazy experiment uh, to push WASM to its limits, I think. And uh, it, let's get started. Lots to talk about. Uh, so I always like to start with a quote to form a thesis. And here's a very relevant one for this experiment. Software equals code plus data. Uh, now, I think I read this in a book somewhere many years ago. If you know where this actually came from, please let me know, because I can't remember myself. But anyway, software systems can sometimes logically be re reduced to some sort of basis of data and then code that performs operations on top of that data. Uh, we collectively spend a lot of time thinking about how to optimize the code, but other than basic things like compression and locality, we don't think nearly as much about how do we actually optimize the data. Uh, so this leads to a potential thesis. Can we, using WebAssembly, replace portions of the data with the instructions to procedurally generate that data? Can this be used to supplement or enhance the fidelity of the data and meet some sort of quality metrics for greater efficiency? Uh, so what do I mean by procedurally generate the data? Let's very, very briefly discuss procedural modeling, because it's a huge topic. Uh, but procedural modeling is essentially just algorithms to generate data. Uh, using some sort of input, it could be a smaller chunk of data, it could be the output of another algorithm. Uh, applying a series of transformations on top of that data to generate higher detail output, often at a much larger scale than the input itself. Um, a great example of this uh, could be something like Minecraft, which pretty much everybody probably knows what that is. Using like a random seed as input, it generates an infinite deterministic procedural world applying those algorithms on that input. Um, there's a lot of different types of, of procedural systems, but you know, for this talk, we'll focus on uh, formal grammars. And in the context of, of kind of 2D and 3D graphics, this gives us just a lot of benefits over manual modeling. It allows us to scale to large spaces, uh, incorporate variations in that data, randomness, uh, supplement noisy or sparse data sets with high resolution details, um, which to help prove our thesis, we think can uh, be a really efficient use of space, trading that kind of compute versus data uh, complexity at runtime to represent these regular structures. So that's great, but what does this have to do with WebAssembly? <laughs> We're at a WebAssembly conference. Well, if you're going to replace arbitrary data with arbitrary code from arbitrary sources at runtime, one can kind of quickly see how all of the benefits we talk about every day with WebAssembly uh, allow it to be a key enabler for these kinds of workloads. If WebAssembly uh, uh, modules validate our thesis that code to generate data can be more efficient than just raw large data sets themselves, uh, the performance benefits, the fast startup time, the security by default, uh, allows us to implement this kind of architecture at runtime instead of just building it offline. Uh, this leads to our first example, uh, which you can see an architecture diagram of here, uh, for a 2D mapping system. So here, map data, like geographic mapping data, is organized into a quad tree, streamed down to a client machine uh, for rendering. But instead of providing like raw graphics behind that, we're streaming WebAssembly workloads. We're streaming tiles uh, to execute which contains a small chunk of procedural data embedded in each, and then references a common library of things like textures to generate the actual map. Here's some of that data uh, as an input for this algorithm uh, for, for, for a tile. So on the top row is input, and below is how it is used. Uh, this is actually an implementation of an algorithm based off of land classification from a very old version of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Everybody's familiar with that. Uh, on the left, you can see there, there's a class map uh, which is a blend texture, essentially. And then that references geotypical textures for the area. You see you've got some trees, you've got some grass, you've got some sand uh, to produce an output like what you see below. You have elevation data, for example, that produces a contour map to supplement that uh, land classification data uh, with additional resolution. Uh, you have compressed vector data, uh, which references things like uh, textures for roads and water. And all of this leads to something that looks like this. This is a procedurally synthesized version uh, 
I, this is uh, Ginny Lake, uh, just uh, in Wyoming in the US. And all of this is generated at runtime. This uh, was built in MScript and, and uh, just running in a browser on a canvas. So you see, it's not a perfect satellite image, but you can see how it is representative and really, most importantly, uh, just can be generated from client side from a compressed limited data set. So let's dig into a bit more detailed example of this, uh, 3D building models. Weird topic, but procedural generation of buildings is, is something that has been covered kind of extensively in academic literature, uh, but this has mostly been centered around offline uh, generation, offline workloads, you're building a static 3D model. Uh, but an artist can exploit the regular structure of things like buildings to quickly generate data for a scene uh, with similar look and feel amongst the objects massively in parallel. Uh, so they'll, they'll generate you know, this, they'll supplement it with high resolution details, uh, you know, more detailed models, like you might put an air conditioner unit on the side of the building up close, uh, and then export that to a static scene that's loaded into a graphics engine. Um, but obviously this comes at a high cost. Like imagine here in Barcelona, if you were to have a high resolution building um, for every, every single building, every single street in the city, it'd be petabytes if not more of data. And so uh, how can we optimize that? Well, we generate this at runtime. And here's an example. On, on the left is a shape grammar. Uh, this is something called CGA representing a building. Middle is the resulting uh, 3D model. And so instead of uh, uh, generating then exporting these procedural models, uh, we offline compile to WebAssembly and then execute the actual modules to generate each building at runtime. And then you can kind of see the output of that on the right. This is just a generic graphics engine, but here's where we have taken that same basic procedural model, executed it to generate a bunch of buildings, slightly varied the parameters, uh, and can generate some pretty amazing level of detail with just a few WASM tiles. Uh, this, so can we successfully do this at scale? That's the question I wanted to prove with this thesis. And I think the answer is yes with some limitations. Uh, first, the split grammar that I showed before, it's parse turned into C++, which is then compiled with Clang to WebAssembly. Uh, this could be optimized with some sort of direct to WebAssembly compilation as well, but this works for now. Uh, the procedural modeling kernel is also written in C++, compiled into the module uh, with translated grammar snippet of which you can see on the left there, uh, kind of an analog to what we saw on the last slide. Um, how do we get data in and out? And in WASI, uh, it's not seamless today. We treat, so we treat each module kind of like a command line program uh, where we parameterize attributes like colors and heights and footprints as uh, command line args. And then we hook a uh, pipe into standard out to, to dump basically the resultant 3D object as just an OBJ file. Um, this is not the most efficient way to do this, but this work also works for now. Um, having each building have their own grammar is not very efficient either, so uh, let's look at some optimizations. Uh, for example, a city block or a neighborhood can look kind of similar, so you can parameterize some of the inputs and add some randomness. As you zoom in close, you could then individually load a detailed individual building grammar as a form of level of detail. So how does this perform? Uh, here's a single-threaded side-by-side comparison of, of two different models, right? See, on the left, you've got a model that's kind of a basic blob, but you know, it looks like a building. On the right, you've got a, a much more high-resolution uh, model, and what you're seeing here is kind of like in nanoseconds uh, through some, you know, just a single-threaded loader built with WASM time uh, loading individual buildings. And you can see that for the small building, the compilation time is high but about the same. Um, but the runtime, the internal time it takes, is much, much faster. And so that's good. And so we've been able to get WebAssembly uh, with things like SIMD. Uh, I think it was up to 60 to 75% of the native performance of this. But you can see still, like, if we were, imagine, like, a camera moving down a street, if we were procedurally generating that building on the right, you know, infinite times over and over again, it is kind of slow. All right, what do we just do there on the left? I just generated 2,000 procedural buildings with one compilation. And so that's kind of where we are headed next with, with this, is uh, maybe we don't AOT compile every single tile every single time. Maybe we exploit regularity between different buildings to be able to reuse that same grammar uh, and just add more variation of parameters. This allows us to really start seeing that city scale data, um, and that kind of leads us to, to where we want to go next with this to, to really get um, you know, just some higher, higher fidelity data. Uh, so we have a working procedural modeling system, um, but our setup is kind of far from ideal given, given those timings that you've seen. 
Uh, if we really want to scale this, it's going to take implementing things like the component model. Uh, here's a basic mock-up of what a procedural modeling operation could look like exposed as a WIC component. Uh, this would allow us, for example, instead of moving common functionality like the geometry kernel into the host, uh, allows for common composable kernel operations themselves in WebAssembly, uh, minimizing the API footprint of what needs to be that separate host functionality to just the communication back and forth. And that allows us to kind of compose and build pluggable graphics objects. Uh, with this kind of architecture, the binary size should be reduced, and my theory is that the compilation performance will significantly improve as well, because we're not compiling the same you know, library code again and, and again and again, tens to hundreds of times per second. Um, but with this architecture, it's, uh, we should be able to uh, generate a large number of, of buildings or really a large number of graphics objects in general uh, based off of this limited set of input and uh, replace a lot of what we saw before. To use, actually, I missed it, but I'm going to go back a slide. But that model on the right, uh, that is 529 kilobyte binary. The resultant, or sorry, yeah, 5.29 kilobyte binary. The resultant uh, OBJ file is four times larger. And so we've shown that even though we're you know, adding a runtime cost to building the data, we have been able to compress the data further. And with larger, higher detailed buildings than the one you see there, we've seen up to 50 to 100x improvements in size. So it's significant. All right, so uh, that was my time. Thanks for listening. I think Wasm is a great enabler for these types of workloads where we can run massively parallel blocks of micro code modules uh, helping us to optimize our data. Um, the link on GitHub there, I don't actually have the code up yet. Uh, there's some things I need to sort out with libraries and whatnot, but hopefully by the time this talk is posted live, uh, we will, I will have that sorted out and uh, hopefully within the next week. So if you want, go star the repo, follow uh, for when the code is there. Any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm very passionate about this stuff. Thanks. And I think I can take any live questions if there's time. Thanks. Thanks for the brevity and the details on that. Could you talk a little bit about your experience with the SIMD optimizations and where you think that's going for you know, real-world high-performance workloads? Yes. So it, it was quite literally necessary to get that performance. So, you know, just compiling with default settings and Clang, like, I think I was seeing like a, I don't remember exactly, it was like a 4 to 5x slowdown compared to native code. So uh, you know, particularly, there's a lot of matrix math involved in some of the, the generative floating point matrix math. And so like when you're using a library like GLM, that helps it. But the other thing I'll say is I think when I, specifically for GLM, I was only able to build it uh, with 128-bit SIMD. Like it doesn't support AVX or anything right now in Wasm SIMD. And so uh, I don't know any, if anybody's looking at that, but that would be a huge performance benefit to workloads like this. Like I think, I think that would, would maybe, maybe even get on par with native performance. All right, thanks.